changing your breathing certainly requires a level of effort and commitment. And that's one of the reasons why we'd like to open up these first sessions of the course, explain all these things to you, and most importantly, give you some challenges over the next 24 hours. And the number one challenge that I have for you all in the next 24 hours is to breathe through your nose. So you have your mouth closed and breathe through your nose. Now most of you are sitting there with your mouth closed, breathing through your nose, and you might think this is easy. You're allowed to eat and drink and speak, by the way. But we find not many people are up to this challenge, and amazingly, probably half fail before they get out of their chair to lead one of these seminars. Because a lot of us, as soon as we have to move, as soon as we have to exert ourselves, we find it more comfortable having our mouth open, or we find it very difficult to keep it closed. Now that I've said this, you'll all stand up later on with you. And see you <laughs> walk out the door. But what happens when you hit the front door, and there's a breeze, and there's a change of temperature? For a lot of us, our breathing will change without us even really being aware. So just observe yourself over the next 24 hours. What happens when you bend down and pick something off the ground? Can you keep your mouth closed and breathe through your nose? See what happens next time you clean your teeth. Can you keep breathing only through your nose? Try having a shower and washing your hair without opening your mouth. Most people find that impossible when they first try it. And watch what happens when you eat. Are you one of these people who tends to take air and food every time you take food? Or can you easily close your mouth and nasal breathe as you chew and swallow your food? And what happens when you speak? People well trained in the Botoko method are easily able to re-breathe through the nose when they need to take air rather than gasping it in through the mouth. And probably the most important thing to observe in yourself in the course of the next 24 hours is what happens when you go to sleep. If you ever, during the night or in the morning, are getting a dry mouth, if you're needing to drink water, if you're waking up feeling tired in the morning despite the fact you've been in bed for a long time, if you're a restless sleeper, if you've got restless leg syndrome, if you're cramping, if you've got poor circulation, if you get pins and needles, if you're uh, regularly getting up to go to the toilet during the night, if you're snoring, if you're having any apnea when you stop breathing, if you're getting asthma, if you're chronically coughing, if you're getting a blocked nose, if you've got any phlegm in your chest, your nose, your throat, some people can relate to this obviously, then that indicates that you'll get great benefit from correcting your breathing with the Botanko method. In fact, improvements in quality of sleep are usually the first things that people notice. And before you go tonight, I'm going to give you three specific strategies so you can start to improve your sleep over the next couple of nights. So yeah, I did well in the Batoko course. I found it hard at times, but I persisted. I was lucky to learn with a very big group because it was hot on the heels after a couple of these current affairs shows. And I kept in contact with a couple of people I'd been through the course with just to see how they were progressing as the weeks went by. And like me, they were only continuing to improve. Then I started to think, well, I wonder what the more long-term effects of Batoko are like. And through a work colleague at the time, I was able to get a hold of some of the original current affairs segments when the method was first featured in Sydney back in 1992. So I subsequently spoke to some people who learned the method over two years previously. And these people were sleeping through the night, off their drugs, feeling better, not getting symptoms, and like me, just could not understand why there wasn't more information around about Botoko. Then I thought, well, I wonder what the Australian Health Authorities think about this. Back then in uh, 1994, it was said that the incidence of asthma in school-aged children had doubled in the previous 10 years, despite all this money being spent on medications and research. And also the rising condition, which is much more well known than it was then, sleep apnea, where people were suddenly being required to either go and have an operation to cut out part of their soft palate, or to go on to the CPAP, continuous positive air pressure machines. So I started off by ringing the health department and I found out that they knew absolutely nothing about the Botago method at all. Then I contacted and subsequently went and saw the Victorian Asthma Foundation and the National Asthma Campaign. And I'm really glad that I did go and meet with those organisations because it gave me an insight that would take a long time before there were going to be any formal changes to the management of respiratory and sleeping conditions. Why? Well, it all comes back to the way that the Botago method was introduced into this country. Normally when there isn't an innovation in something like respiratory or sleeping problems, the information goes from the top down. That would be from the thoracic society to the specialists, the hospitals, the GPs and nurses and out to the public. But as I've explained today, the Botoko method has very much taken a different path. Very much come from the bottom up. Particularly in the early days, very much the media and the people who learnt the method who tended to move it ahead. It's really only in more recent times with the publication of results of clinical trials and some of the other work of the Botago Institute that more has been known about the method. So what they said to me at these organisations was, oh yes, we've heard about Botago, we know it's been in the papers, 
and every time it's on TV, people ring us up and ask us about it. But uh, we can't really say much because we haven't got much information. And I explained to them about my own improvement. I told them I'd gone through this course with about 35 other people with a range of conditions, all getting good results. But it didn't seem to matter what I was saying. I didn't really feel like I was getting very far. So I said, well, look, you know, what's the problem? This is really a great opportunity to improve people's health. And here the Asthma Foundation said, well, there's really two problems. Firstly, there's nothing published on Botaco in the Western medical literature. And secondly, there's no formal organisation representing the method. Now, this is back in 1994. Those things are well and truly happened now, of course. But I explained to them then that it was impossible because this has been locked up under communism for 40 odd years. But I still didn't really seem to be getting anywhere. So eventually I said, well, what do we do to try to take this thing forward? And the response from the head of the Astrid Foundation was, well, if you're really serious about this, you need to go and talk to the Federal Health Minister. And at the end of that meeting, his response to her was, well, if you're really serious about this, you need to go and talk to the head of the Astrid Foundation. And that was when we realised we were going to go round and round in circles. That was when we made the decision to form the Potato Institute of Breathing and Health. We started as a group of 10 people in the mid-90s in Australia and New Zealand. We've now got over 100 members in 14 countries around the world. Well, after my experiences with these organisations, I spent a bit more time thinking about the whole issue of Botago and uh, wrote quite a few letters to other health organisations, parliamentarians, people in the media. But if any of you have any experience in social improvement issues, you're probably aware that you tend to send a lot of letters off, but not many come back your way. So after that, I made the decision to apply to do the Botago Practitioner Training Course. And I did that over the last several months of 1994. Uh, so I'm now to my 12th year teaching the method. In that time I've now taught over 4,000 people, uh, probably about two-thirds of those throughout Victoria, and uh, increasingly in recent years the work overseas I've mentioned in the UK, the US and Cuba, and also quite a lot interstate in the last couple of years.